everyone. Welcome to Duna's World. I'm your host, Mike Dino Muldoon. Broadcasting from Mayapack, New York. It's Friday, TGIF. So excited. Long week. Uh, I want to thank all my guests this week. I had Derek Giles on. My, my brother down in Georgia. Just met him this week. Great show with him. Bill Dwight, uh, fam, famzoo.com. Uh, Jacqueline Claire, she was awesome. JacquelineClaireArt.com. Uh, JV Martinez was on. Had a really fun week. Really looking forward to next week, too. That Carlton Shank, Mike Imperato down in Florida, Jersey boy. Um, great rants. Can't wait to talk to him. I have a few building up things that I've talked to Mike about. Um, Melinda Livingston from Australia is coming on, a fellow podcaster on Wednesday. Lori Fairbanks, singer from Cunt Punch, whoo, coming on from California. She's a total badass. Um, then ending the week next week with Amanda Ayala, who does a killer version of Mississippi Queen. If you haven't seen it, look it up. Amanda Ayala, she was on The Voice. Uh, she turned a bunch of chairs. She's a total rock star. Can't wait to talk to her. Then we're getting into Halloween week. Ed Palermo, Ed Mann, Dawn Jenkins from uh, um, Female Centrix. We're going to have a good fish Halloween discussion. Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction and Porno for Porno for Pyros on Thursday. And then Del Bozio on Friday. And breaking news, big announcement. Ike Willis Halloween show. That's right. Doing this world. Ike Willis. Scott Parker is going to join me from Zappacast.com. It's going to be fun. We're celebrating Frank. Every day, but especially those days. So I got the whole week with Frank and Fish and Jane's addiction. But Halloween, big announcement. Ike Willis, Scott Parker from Zappacast. It's going to be fucking awesome. Uh, today you got Ralph Hewitt, my buddy from Rock Retrospect. Um, you've seen me talk about him, gosh, for months and months and months. He wrote this book on Led Zeppelin, a lot of lead. A uh, photographer who took ama- has taken so many good pictures of Jerry and Jerry. And uh, where's the, I love this one. This one Ralph took with Frank, with Big John watching over Frank. Oh. Let's bring Ralph in. Let's get it going. We're going to talk about the Yardbirds and Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin today. Let's bring Ralphie in. Oh, where is he? There he is. Hey, Ralph. Hey, Abby. My nice friend, to hey. see you again. Good to see you. How you doing, man? I am so happy to be back on your show. I want to thank you for letting me on. I've been doing really well. I've been staying safe. Staying safe, staying healthy, listening to good music, and good. thinking about great music too. You know, me as well. Me as well. You know, these times where we're, we're, we're a lot of introspective time, right? Where you can really do that and connect to music, and then kind of settle into it and have it permeate your soul a little deeper than in the past because we're stuck. <laughs> you know, that's so true. And I also think, speaking for me, I think one of the more important things is still stay in touch with people like we're doing yep. with Zooming and computering and Using emailing technology to our and benefit. phone call. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing that with friends, some friends I grew up with in high school, some friends that saw some great bands also. I have a friend that lives up in Dunsmuir, which is up near the Sacramento area, and he saw a lot of great concerts in the 60s. A friend of mine mm-hmm. named Mike. And uh, he went to the Hollywood Bowl. He saw the doors at the Hollywood Bowl. He Ooh, saw um, Jimi Hendrix, saw the Jefferson Airplane in the doors on the, I think it was the 3rd or the 5th of July. Uh, and the Doors organization made a movie of the Doors concert there. And my friend Mike was at that. So we, we talk about good memories we had. I didn't get to go to those shows. I saw other shows about that same time. Right, right. And the, 67, 68, 69. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to go into shows I saw, especially uh, Led Zeppelin and also uh, some shows my friends saw of the Yardbirds. So that's kind so of let's what go way back. Let's go today. back to like 63 or 62 or where do you want to start? That's a good question. Well, <laughs> I think we go into the origins of the band and with this book we're going to kind of like base i'm going to base my talk a little bit on the book and basically mm-hmm. you know with a whole lot of lead and you i want you to ask me all the different stuff that you know uh is unanswered with this there we go a little, little better view of it Great book. but anyway it's kind of like a time capsule and my author your co-author Jerry Proshnicki, who wrote a biography on Jim Morrison called um, Break On Through, The Life and Death of Jim Morrison. Jerry is a big 60s music fan, and this book was his concept. Mm. And in it, we wanted to delve really deep into the the uh, stories and myths 
that have followed Led Zeppelin for years and looking at what has traveled over the winds of past tra traditions. Uh, we also look at the, the members, each member's backgrounds and uh, their relationships, uh, musical influences, and also uh, we really highlight Paige's vision in forming Led Zeppelin. And we talk about the tours. Each tour is covered in detail by eyewitness accounts, people we interviewed, and how they wrote the albums. Mm -hmm. And then we have photographers' stories. I'm going to show a few photos from the book today. And so I go into the detail of rock music firsthand with my own stories, too. So that's, that's kind of a summary of where the book, uh, the backbone of the book is all about. So I'm going to talk about side that. note. Side note: There's two pages about meeting Frank Zappa and his quote on punk rock and <laughs> right and Sky Saxon. That's right. It's a great. That book. was quite an evening. Oh, that was in September of '77 at the San Diego State Library. September 9, I, I don't want to subtract. We've talked yourself. about that. We've covered that before. Let's keep it on. Let's keep it on Jimmy and the boys. Yeah, and, and if you do want to see other pictures from that moment in time, uh, my website, Rock Retrospect, has. All kinds of different uh, photos of bands uh, yeah. from different eras. And um, so you can just go to rockretrospect.com and it will show you the whole gallery of over 150 artists. And there's like This is one of my favorites. You got Frank drinking a Heineken. I've been drinking Heineken. Just cause you're Frank inspired by this picture. He had that little little Playmate cooler under his I take a picture of that chair. Screenshot. And Frank there he is. Him. Yeah. I was trying to, I was really trying to interact with him through that whole evening. And I finally got to for over 45 minutes. And I know. After everybody uh, left and there he is by himself. Magic. In the San Diego State Library on the third floor. And so I went up and I just talked to him about my friend Clyde Johnson, who saw the Yardbirds with Jimmy Page in 1967 and how Captain Beefheart was at that concert the Santa Monica Civic Show. And maybe oh, that's where right. we'll, we'll start is the Yardbirds and getting into how, you so That's know, funny. That's one of those things you talked to Zappa about, how Clyde had been at that Yardbirds show with Jimmy and you and saw Beefheart at that show. Captain Beefheart had met Clyde in a club in Glendale. And Clyde didn't have... Clyde had some nice equipment and Beefheart didn't have a good amplifier. That's and right, he yeah. saw Clyde's Fender Bandmaster and said, hey, can I borrow that after your set? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm... I need an amp. And so he remembered Clyde later when Clyde saw him the following year at Santa Monica Civic right, right. after Safest Milk had come out, Beefheart's first album. And Beefheart recognized Clyde in the audience and went out after their set before the Yardbirds came on and visited with him. And that That's was really so cool. That's That's those really were really cool. neat times to have things yeah. like that happen, you know? Yeah. And so the Yardbirds, uh, he went, Clyde and went to see the Yardbirds and uh, it was the, their last incarnation. Here's a photo from the book of their last incarnation after Jeff Beck had left. And this right. was with Jimmy Page and on the far end in the white shirt. Then Keith Ralph, Chris Drea, and Jim McCarty with the uh, funeral home shirt pulling right. a Coke. And right. so Clyde wrote about seeing them at Santa Monica Civic. And so, you know, the ultimate Yardbirds was probably this lineup, just to show you one more photo, with uh, Beck, Beck, Beck and Page. And Page. Well, any this slow hand diehards would beg to differ, but yeah, that's that's just... It's too bad they didn't make an album with that whole lineup. You know, they yeah. uh, they did Happenings 10 Years Time Ago, and Stroll On, and Beck's Bolero, I think, was also with both Page and Beck, but then right. after that, it just kind of dissolved. So... With Led Zeppelin, the Yardbirds were kind of like this uh, launching pad for the careers of three guitar players that went on to form their own super groups. Eric Clapton uh, with Cream, and he, he uh, before he started Cream, he left the Yardbirds because he didn't like For Your Love. He thought it was That's too That's right, commercial. right. So, so he was like the hotshot kid, right? So Clapton was, and people talked about how he was kind of an asshole, right? He was kind of like, because he was so good, but but... Once they went in that direction, he just said he can't do it because he was he wanted to be true to the blues, right? And he just had to go his own direction. Join, join John Mayall, right? It was John Mayall after, after he was in uh, the Blues Breakers after right, the after for your love. And, and for your love, Clapton, Clapton did point out people thought he was kind of 
<laughs> not the greatest guy for what he did, leaving the Yardbirds, because back then people didn't do that very often. They just didn't up and leave a rock group, especially if they had a contract and it's they were getting young, hit so records. Very young, you didn't young, leave yeah. a group. Yep. Yep. You know, that would definitely change as the 60s wound on. Various groups would break up and reform and change members. This happened to Love. This happened to the Buffalo Springfield. True. There were many 60s groups that would befall the same fate. But um, the Yardbirds, their biggest problem was bad management. They didn't have good management at all. And um, by the time Paige had joined, they were in the throes of uh, a lot of change. And when Little Games came out, you know, unfortunately, this this particular album, you know, had a nice psychedelic type cover and all that. But that it wasn't really, didn't really reach the full potential of what they could have uh, done with Paige and the group. But it did have great moments, like Glimpses was a great psychedelic instrumental. Mm -hmm. And also Drinking Muddy Water, I liked that. I liked Smile on Me. I liked White Summer, Paige's great showpiece. So what I wanted to do was, I was going to describe a little bit of the Santa Monica Civic Show. Uh, this yeah, is after yeah. Beck had left. And nobody knew in the audience that Beck wasn't going to be there. And um, he had a breakdown. Like he had a breakdown, right? Some kind of mental breakdown, or yeah, he got. Uh, there, there were various problems Beck had, and he was a player of emotion. So mm -hmm. when he was playing in his uh, guitar work on recordings or even in concert, and it wasn't quite reaching where emotionally he wanted to uh, reach, musically speaking, he would get really angry and um, either walk off the stage or not show up for a show sometimes if he wasn't. In, in a mental state uh, to perform well. Mm. And so there was, there was a lot of, one reason Paige joined was to try to get back. Oh, you're freezing up, Ralph. You're freezing up, buddy. You're freezing up. Hold on a second. Because Paige didn't want to turn it down. Hold on a second, Ralph. You're freezing up. You're freezing up on me. Hold on a second. Let's see if this catches up. You froze. After can, you, can you hear me? Wow. He was offered the elite guitarist position. Yes. Oh. Just internet connection unstable. Okay, we'll we'll keep going and see what happens. Okay. I can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't. You're you're. you're really so anyway, this this particular yeah. concert, my. Can you hear me? Can you see me now? Keep going. Keep going, Ralph. You're good. Is that man moving? So this concert was on the 22nd of July, 1967. And the show was in, this, in the spirit of, you know, what was going on in San Francisco at the Avalon Ballroom. And the doors were played to Santa Monica Civic on July 3rd, and they were about to hit the circuit and auditoriums up in San Francisco. And so the uh, Santa Monica Civic was a little larger scale than say Huntington Beach's Golden Bear or the Whiskey or Go-Go in Hollywood, but it was still mm. small compared to the Hollywood Bowl and places like that. It was perfect for people like Jimi Hendrix or the Stones. Mm. So this was going to be like a, a concert that was, had a lot of int intimacy to it. And the idea was to make it a love-in, an inside love-in. And it was sort of a gathering of tribes is what Clyde I'm going to read Clyde's quote about it. He said, awesome. at the Santa Monica concert with the Yardbirds headlining, it was a gathering of tribes kind of thing. There was a festive mood. It had the feeling of a Griffith Park love-in. Everybody would be at the park and be playing bongos, flutes, playing acoustic guitars. Sometimes some people would be smoking uh, doobies. But he did say at the Santa Monica show, as far as drugs being passed, there were very few because everybody that was there, especially the Yardbirds fan, fans, were there for the music. And that was the big thing. So the show started off with uh, various other bands, including the West Coast Pop Experimental Band and Captain Beefheart and Moby Gray. And then when the Yardbirds were about to come out, uh, he mentioned that this is the band you've all been waiting to hear, the group whose songs you have heard and songs you have played. A lot of people in the audience had bands of their own in the Hollywood yeah. scene. And the guy said that because the Yardbirds' influence had since stripped a music scene to the max. And you had to have a 
you had your own band and you wanted to play a gig in Hollywood, you had to put that hard edge to it. You had to sound like the Kinks yeah. or the Stones or the Yardbirds. And that that's where the Yardbirds, they were very um, well-respected in California as an influential band. In England, by the time Page joined, nobody seemed to care, but not in the United States. They had a big following. Right. So everybody was told Beck wasn't going to be there. And so they were murmuring their disappointment. And then um, the Yardbirds played about 60 or 70 minutes. And Clyde's reaction, he said, Lord, help us. We are all in another land. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, as a rhythm section, it was probably the tightest one I've ever heard. Period. You could not stick a needle between the riffs. So what it did was give Page a lot of room to move. He could go anywhere he wanted. He could have gone to the moon with his leads. And that's what he did at this concert. So he was basically saying, Page blew everybody away. And so by the end of the concert, everybody is going out the doors wondering, you know, not what happened to Beck and why wasn't Beck there. They're all babbling about Page. And by then, he was becoming a superstar bound for the stars in his own metaphoric way. Yeah. Um, and they did uh, a version of Days to Confuse by a folk singer named Jake Holmes, and it was called I'm Confused, and mm-hmm. it's on that Live Yardbirds album. Uh, they have different words that Re- Ralph had written, but it was basically the same kind of uh, progression as Days to Confused would be later on. Mm-hmm. And this was progressive rock at the time, Yardbird style. They had come a long way from this rhythm of blues band that Clapton had envisioned them to be right so they were one one word you could use to describe them was electric but also very progressive for their time they were ahead of their time not only in their records but in their music Mm -hmm. so unfortunately the band would break up the following year and um we have a couple of other accounts i'm not going to read them i did want to read you a little bit of the santa monica show because That had never been written about in a book before. And I thought it was really cool that my friend Clyde had gotten to see it. Yeah, that's really, I mean, when Paige, because he first joined, I thought, wasn't it, he joined on bass at that point, right? He was supposed to be on bass because he had replaced, um, what's his name? Uh, You know, I can't, what's the bass player's name Paige replaced? Oh, Paul Samuel Smith. Paul Smith, right, right. Chris Jr. took over on bass after Paige moved to lead guitar. Do you know how many gigs Paige actually played on bass with the Yardbirds? Was it like six? If you watch the movie uh, uh, Blow Up, there's a scene. They, they did want to have the, the Who in there, but they couldn't get the Who. So they had the Yardbirds right. in there, and you see right. Jimmy Page playing a bass. Right. And Jeff Beck is in the group, and he, and he puts his the guitar, right? uh, guitar neck through his amp. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing stroll on. <laughs> so, do you know how many gigs Page actually played on bass, Ralph? How long was it before he actually came on guitar for the Yardbirds? Originally, after Samuel Smith left, right. they hired Paige to play bass. And I don't know exactly how many weeks or months, but... That's what I'm wondering. It was like four Paige, shows? Paige, Paige and Beck found out. There was a few times Jeff Beck couldn't make... I think it was the Carousel Ballroom where Jeff Beck didn't make the show. And Paige right. took over on lead. And right. the Yardbirds blew their mind going, wow, this guy can keep it going even if Beck yeah. leaves. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Beck eventually was asked to leave by Paige because he kept missing gigs. Um, I want to kind of switch to Led Zeppelin now, um, but I think, you know, when they, when they were recording with Beck and Page, it wasn't long enough time to record a whole album's worth of material, which is too bad because that was the ultimate lineup for fans was yeah. Beck and Page, you know, but um, anyway, one thing, one thing I wish I could have seen was the show that they were still called the Yardbirds at the time. The New Yardbirds and, um, or the Yardbirds? The New Yardbirds or the Yardbirds. Either one. The Billings. Well, at you know, point, they when they added the new, it was that toward Scandinavia, right? When they added the New Yardbirds. And, yeah, it was on and September 7th. At the Gladstax Teen Club, Jorgen Angel was the house photographer. Okay, this was in 1968. And by then, Page had assembled the new band. And this is the photo from that particular gig. Whoops, yeah. I'm way too close. There we go. Yeah, that's And just... this is in the book. Uh, this was their first gig 
as a band, but they were still called the Yardbirds at that time. Wow, Jorgen yeah. Angel did, did a series of photographs of this particular gig, and so we, we used this one in the book. They, they were mainly doing the first album because it was right. recorded with some overdubbing, but pretty much live, so they could recreate it live. Mm. Um, Jorg and Angel got to watch the rehearsal while they were setting up uh, That's decorations. Awesome. That's amazing. And uh, so September 7th, they were one over, he, they went over the band, the, the band went over the crowd. And, and where, where was that at? That was a the place called the Glad Sax Team Club in Copenhagen. Oh, right, right, right. That was a Scandinavian. It was on the outskirts of Copenhagen, Denmark. And yep. Jorgen was a teenage Yardbirds fan. So he was thinking, oh, great. I get wow. to see the Yardbirds again. And then he found out it was Paige and three unknown guys. And nobody knew who they were at the time. You know? wow. So this, this was brand new. And then that would the have been a great spot at the right yeah. time. Holy cow. <laughs> Man. So, you know, Jorgen Angel, we have his account in the book mm -hmm. and his story. And, you know, as, as Led Zeppelin went on, they, they stormed across America, uh, just continuing to uh, be a group that people had never heard before. But, you know, it's not just a nostalgic type of thing. Part of what I wanted to just touch on was, you know, why Led Zeppelin now? You know, why, why are they important today? You know, they were important then, but what's the deal with them now as far as, you know, why? Why are they important now? And... One thing is they were the last wave of the British invasion. You know, you first you get the Beatles and the Stones, and then you get your second wave with a whole bunch of groups. And the Yardbirds were kind of at the end of that wave, like in 1966, 67. And then 68, the um, Yard, Jimmy Page you know, renamed the Yardbirds Led Zeppelin in October. And uh, because of a comment, Keith Moon made saying, oh, this band that you're forming, they'll probably go down like a, a Led Zeppelin or a Led Balloon, I think he said. Yeah, it's funny. That was, that's thing. common. A lot of people have heard that. But, Ralph, one thing I hadn't heard is why he changed the spelling. Do you know why, why Jimmy changed the spelling from Led being L-E-A-D to L-E-D? I think there were two reasons. One was you didn't want to confuse it with lead, right. like the lead right. guitar player. The other right. reason right. is... The word lead gives you this uh, feeling or a sense of something heavy, something with substance. Something well, I thought that, that might have been gonna... purposeful because they are—they really are the original heavy metal, right? So that—that that, that part I thought was, uh, but yeah, the whole lead thing, lead this, would have been this annoying. idea, of this blimp, which is flying through the air, and it's like lead, and it's, it's a juxtaposition of the idea yeah. of. Light right. versus shade and yeah. heavy versus yeah. light. Helium versus, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, I mean, you could take that in so many different directions. Yeah, that's the beauty oh, of it, too. Yeah. yeah. And I think the thing about them was, you know, once they started touring uh, in earnest in 1960, they, you know, came at the end of 68, mm. and then they started playing at the Whiskey, and then they went to the Fillmore West, and then they played the Fillmore East, which was like a huge show mm -hmm. uh they this photo is uh a page at the Fillmore east and we have this in our photo book too uh beautiful which came out uh, a little later than this book but there he is with a psychedelic telecaster that he painted mm -hmm. and this is another picture of them at the Fillmore east when i saw them it was uh may of 69 and this was after the uh very first tour they did uh may of 69 was during their second tour they were in hawaii they were in california this is where'd you, where you see them where'd you see them in 68 cool oh that's a great picture where'd you see them first ralph what was the venue so i was almost 18 years old i went with my girlfriend at the time from high school to see them at the rose palace in pasadena it was on may the second and the third I went to the May 2nd show, and we have a photo from that concert in here, too. Um, they played at the Rose Palace in Pasadena, and that was the place where they made the people uh, from all over California would come and make the Rose Parade floats. And here's a photo from that concert. Um, it was taken by, I didn't take this, but it was taken by Norwood Price, who was the photographer I got to know who did a lot amazing, of amazing. shows in Hollywood. And 
you know, by then they were being the innovators of heavy rock. They they were playing. That's why we call the second chapter in the whole lot of lead. You shook me because they shook audiences from the East Coast to the West Coast. Okay. And that Willie Dixon song, they took it and turned it on its turned it on its head with this new heavy rock sound that nobody was quite doing the same way, except with the exception of probably the Jeff Beck group, who. Yeah, that was a, that Truth album was very influential too, and mm. uh, I always liked how they did "I Ain't Superstitious" on that album. The Wah Wah effects, and Jeff uh, yeah, it's amazing, incredible stuff. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so I'd say, you know, Led Zeppelin they did "You Shook Me" and "I Can't Quit You, Baby," two Willie Dixon songs, mm-hmm. so well and so uniquely at the time. It was very unique at the time. And there's Willie Dixon. That? Hey. And I heard those songs. Yeah, I Yay. took that at the Belly Up Tavern in 1980. They had a big yes, blues revival uh, <laughs> show. And I was their house photographer for a few years. So I got to meet and see all these great blues guys. You ate uh, pizza with Was it Willie Dixon you ate pizza with? Yeah, that was in 1975, before that oh. photo, uh, at the Backdoor Club. He did a show with the Chicago All-Stars. And they did all of his great stuff. And they closed with Wang Dang Doodle. And Ooh. Willie Dixon put his bass aside. He'd been playing the stand-up bass, kind of like in the Stray Cats, they have a stand-up bass. Mm-hmm. Same thing. He puts the what bass down. And I don't know how old he was by 1975 when I saw that show. But he started doing a little soft shoot, just dancing all over on the stage. And for some reason, I just I thought that was really cool. And John Lee Hooker would do that too. He he put his guitar down and he'd start moving around the stage. And he was an incredible yep. blues guy too. Yeah, that's at the back door club. Oh, I love that one, man. Your John Lee Hooker thing. pictures are so good. I, I like I, this one. I although this one, this one might be my guy. favorite. This might be my favorite, though. Yeah. I think that's my favorite of yours. Of your that John was Lee Hooker. That was the night I met him. That was in 1978 at the back door club, and I did an interview with him for the school newspaper. Oh, that was well, really really like, awesome. Tell me about that. So Lee Hooker. So how, tell me about that. Let me let me. Uh, you know they did that. Led Zeppelin will later do rock and roll medleys as they continued on in their career, and they uh, they did boogie chilling, and they would do that for like who knows five, ten, fifteen minutes. They would fit in all these. That's right. Songs. They had that little fourth, that little medley they would do, and, and yes, I remember that. that uh, There's a good version of that uh, whole medley on the. Uh, how the West was one CD. Yep. It's got one of the better long versions. It starts off a whole lot of love and then it just goes into all these other songs. It's funny. So as I, you were talking earlier, I was remembering the How the West long. was one release because I haven't listened to that in so long. And I, you just made me think of that. That's so good. I got to go back. I think there's a DVD to that too, right? I might have the DVD of that. Ooh. And then the other thing I like about that How the West was one 1972 was the, um, the way Page did an extended guitar solo on Immigrant Song because if you listen to, you know, the version on Led Zeppelin 3, it's too short. You know, I mean, I would have liked to have a nice grinding guitar solo in the middle of that, even if it's only for a minute. But, you know, they... Well, if you're going to go there, to earlier guitar, today, so. earlier today, my friend, I watched the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jeff Beck induction, when Paige and him do that version of Immigrant Song. Yeah. And Beck is ripping the lead and the beat. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was the thunders of the God. I, I like, un- Unbelievably. Immigrant song. There's something special about the immigrant song. <laughs> something very special. But to hear Jeff Beck rip it like that was, yeah. The, the intertwinedness of Beck and Page is, I wish Clapton had been more involved in that, right? If Because now there was the Page-Beck connection, but Clapton kind of seemed, although friendly, musically was never as connected to the other two, I didn't feel, feel, you know? I have a story about that. It's not, it's not a real... It doesn't have a good ending. I'll tell it. It's <laughs> no, not very exciting either. Ending. That's why we have the blues, baby. <laughs> this book has got a lot more exciting stories. It's got some of my more funny stories, too. Yeah. Getting chased down by the security guards in 1977 at the L.A. Forum for selling photos. They caught me, but I was able to get out of it. I didn't, I didn't get in trouble, as it turned out. But You've been a rock and roll outlaw really for decades. Wanted to, we, had to, we had to work out a deal. They got some photos out of the deal. But um, the story is the arms concert with Jeff Beck. Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page. 82, 83? 82, 83 was... When was it? it was in the early 80s. Yeah, I've was, seen the video. It's a great pro shot video of one of those shows out there. I don't remember. because Yeah, it's, yeah. Great it's, tour. It's not memorable for me because I didn't make it. I was going to drive up there. I didn't have a ticket. My car broke down. 
<laughs> oh, no. Oh, I had that friends was, that went to that and got great pictures. That, that was I Jimmy's first performance. Those were Jimmy's first performances after Bottom died, right? That tour. I think so. I think yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I See, the LA Forum is a different animal, f- photographically speaking, than mm-hmm. uh, the San Diego Sports Arena. Because the Sports Arena, I got the security system wired, and I learned how to work around the security guards and still get close, even if I didn't have a good seat, technically, for the entire show. But I worked deals with people in the first five rows saying, if you let me in for 10, 15 minutes... I will get you great pictures from this show later. And that worked many times. That's a good sound. Other times, uh, the seats would be empty and nobody would ever come to get them. And that happened in 77 when I saw Zeppelin in June 9th, June 19th, 1977. There was a 10th row seat. But to get to it, I had to jump over, a, climb over a barricade with all my camera gear. <laughs> and that worked. The odds were really against me on that one, but that worked. And... Uh, that was great because three hours in the tenth row with Led Zeppelin, their, their shows were, you know, getting longer all the time, and I think one reason, one reason Led Zeppelin for me is um, still relevant today, and maybe you can comment on this, is because the kind of things they were doing at the time, not just the first two albums, but also the way their music evolved. It still had relevancy, even though it wasn't the same as the first two albums. And I know some Led Zeppelin fanatics, you know, and Jerry and I go back and forth about this. Oh, Led Zeppelin. The only real Led Zeppelin music is the first two albums. No, bullshit. That's bullshit on that. They, oh, that's, no, give me a break. But no. it depends on your point of view. Sure. But, but uh, I, I will I, say their, their blimp cover, you, you, you could not improve on this this cover was just state-of-the-art for the time the black and white stipple uh ink uh touch-up that they used from the hindenburg crashing Mm -hmm. nobody was envisioning this kind of thing for a cover before and this has got to be the 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 top cover in the top album in my book of led zeppelin ever in the history of popular music and you know they they became popular music you know they they kind of encapsulated the whole idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll throughout the 70s. I don't think they invented that idea by a long shot, but they they probably epitomized it more than any other band, whether you, you know, liked it or not. You know, and other groups had come along like Motley Crue and many other bands in the 80s and the 70s that would take that. And Van Halen is another band. It's an example. They take it to another whole level of, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and party. You, you can't keep doing that indefinitely and survive. You just yeah, well, can't, John especially Bonham if you're in a, a yeah. band. Yeah. Yeah. But no. this cover was okay. They got the blimp idea again, but I, it didn't hold a candle to the first album, in my view. And then the inside, I didn't think the inside was so great. But, you know. I like I two better than one, personally. But, Ralph, my summary is I think Led Zeppelin were able to fuse the soul and – and everything of blues Americana in with this ageless mysticism of, of not only like the cosmos, but of, of, of folklore on, on earth. And that's why they were just such a timeless, unheard of thing. And they, and they did it with a, with a heavier, uh, uh, it, was, it was like punk rock and, and rock and roll and the Beatles, everything like came into Zeppelin and like formed this synergetic thing that was two plus two is 12. Right. So they just came in like, even from the Yardbirds to Zeppelin was like, that went from seven to 12, right. They just, and it was something, it was that, it was, there was a je ne sais quoi about Paige, Plant, you know, Robert and, 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 uh, and Jimmy that just, uh, uh, what did I forget, bottom. It, it was just something that's otherworldly. It was ridiculous, like otherworldly is the only way to describe it. So, I mean, to limit to the first two albums is, is, is uh, uh, kind of silly, I think, especially it's up with four, hello. I mean, my favorite is, is uh, Houses of the Holy. I, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, yeah, Houses of the Holy. Um, so it makes sense. Well, going along those lines, you're, talking about as far as the evolution of the music you, you can trace a lot of it back to the Yardbirds because their oh, emphasis it, yeah. absolutely the emphasis uh was not just uh, progressing and moving on it was there were other emphasis other levels of emphasis for example the emphasis on the guitar and is that too dark can you make that out uh, well, move it. yeah there you can see it yep yep 
Okay. Well, and of course, Page, it was, I mean, the sounds that he got of an amplifier and his, his creativity and experimentation were just things that nobody was doing. And he was doing it when he was 20. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. The experimentation aspect, if, if you look at a, the idea of a flower, a metaphor could be like a flower. You know, what are the roots of that flower? You've got emphasis on guitar. You got the emphasis on something besides psych. Psych would be one of the roots. Another one, other roots would be world music. If you listen to Over Under Sideways Down, you've got uh, rock, India, music, on Norwegian wood. Over under sideways down came out in 1966. A lot of different sounds. His albums lacked, especially for your love. That was more popular, geared towards singles and popular music. It was still good, but it was different. Right. And so, you know, they they emphasized guitar. They emphasized world music, and they also emphasized psych. Before it was even called psych. I don't think psych was even a term at the time. Here's a better copy of that. Uh, Jimmy Page, maybe you can make it out a little bit better. Uh, yeah, it's a that's better, at yeah. the San Diego Sports Arena during uh, their opening number. Song remains the same. So the song. emphasis was always going to be on guitar. And as time went on with the Yardbirds, uh, their producers, they had different producers, different managers. They wanted to de-emphasize things like the guitar. When again, it's what Page's whole vision of what the Yardbirds and later on Led Zeppelin would be little from the Yardbirds and just a whole different kind of entity, different album than the first two Led Zeppelin albums. And in fact, Led Zeppelin 3, which I think has some of their best music on it, especially with Since I've Been Loving You, it wasn't all acoustic. One side was, you know, songs like Since I've Been Loving You, Plants doing it like a, a Janis Joplin thing. It's amazing on that song. Yeah, that's it gets, a, yeah, it gets the hottest song. Above. Yeah, he's... Uh, Amazing. Nobody played heavy blues like Led Zeppelin did. And, mm-hmm. you know, if it wasn't for people like Muddy Waters and Willie Dixon and uh, John Lee Hooker, you know, Led Zeppelin wouldn't have been able to incorporate Sunhouse, that blues Sunhouse, B. B. King. idea mm-hmm. into their format, which was emphasis on light and shade, heavy and light. Yep. Heavy yep. rock. Yes, Paige mm-hmm. used that term a lot in interviews. Well, mm-hmm. I want to create a band that had light and shade. And so, you know, a lot of people were not doing that. You know, you had your Stones, you had the Beatles, and they were hugely successful. But, you know, they were playing like uh, a lot of Chuck Berry inspired and Buddy Holly inspired rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And they elevated that to a new level. People learned more about Chuck Berry, not to diminish groups like that at all. The Beatles kicked the door in on the British invasion. Of course, of course. They were hugely influential. But in a different way, Led Zeppelin, especially with world music and psych and emphasis on heavy guitar and also the trippy lyrics, like, you know, um, Song Remains the Same. You know, that that song has a lot of trippy lyrics. And then, of course, you've got Stairway to Heaven. No Plant being an unbelievable lyric writer by then in 1971. What kind of lyrics or songs do you like as far as the lyrics that Led Zeppelin produced? No Quarter. No Quarter is one of my favorites. Uh, song Remains the Same might be my favorite Led Zeppelin song. Um, but what you made me think of was the juxtaposition of songs like going from immigrant song to like Broaden Your Stop or White Summer, right? That light and dark. Like they just went to other extremes that the Stones didn't even do. Like even with their, you know, they might do an acoustic song, but like they took it to, if, again, take immigrant song and Song Remains the Same which is driving the train 110 miles down the track down to, you know, or going to California or, or, you know, it's, it's, it really did do that light and dark to more extremes than anybody else ever did. And that's what opened up things for so many other bands, you know, in, in both white and country. I mean, it lets up with influences country, rap, rock, metal, everything. It's, it's, and you got the Joni Mitchell influence in yeah, Led Zeppelin yeah. four. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you can trace Sandy it back Denny, to Sandy Denny, Sandy Denny, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she she sang uh, uh, the um, Battle of Evermore. What are what are now? There's a there's a great example of English 
Madrigal slash folk music. Ralph, when I was and a kid, I, I got a mandolin just so I could learn how to play that song when I was like 13. I was like, I want a mandolin. Like, you know, Christmas came and like, I put it on my list just so I could learn how to play that song. <laughs> I got heard I think that's really later. cool. I never wanted to play mandolin. I played guitar for many I only years. wanted to learn the one song, and then I gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> a comment on uh, world music. You mentioned White Summer a minute ago. Now, that's, that song, is a, that epitomizes world music right there. You've got, you know, you've got the guitar riffs that are amazing, but then you've got, you know, that uh, wind instrument. I don't know what you call it. It's like an Indian version of a horn or something. Right, uh, right. Playing in the second starting with the second verse of the second uh, stanza when it would come around in the instrumental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Bert Jansch, Jimmy Page really revered him. And uh, I think it's the Jack O'Ryan album on Vanguard. Uh, Some of you folks listening to this may look that song up. It's called Black Waterside. Well, if you listen to Black Waterside, that's almost note for note like Black Mountainside. I have that album. I was going to show you the cover, but I didn't get it out in time today. I was busy with other things. But Bert Jansch, uh, he was one of those, you know, British guitar players who, like, uh, they grew up Pentangle, same kind of uh, British folk music kind of influenced music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, incredible string band, that sort of thing. Um, Black Waterside is where Paige got the inspiration for Black Mountainside. Right. Right. Uh, I think you could have given more credit where when it was due sometimes. Oh, I'm not so sure about the Randy California uh, versus Led Zeppelin thing on Stairway to Heaven. I've listened to both songs. And Spirit, right? Taurus, Spirit was the band that was suing? Taurus does have a similar progression after the strings. The strings come in first right. on Taurus by Spirit. And the guitar part sounds similar in some ways, but it, it goes in a different direction. And so yeah. does Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Maybe for the first 15 seconds, it's similarities, right. but not note right. for note exactly the same. Yeah, I agree. I want it in there. They, they got to let that, lay that, let, let that go. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, Ralph, what are we going to talk about next time, man? So we've talked about Zappa. We've talked about Zeppelin. We got to think about what we're going to talk about next time, man, because uh, your, your well is so deep and I have so much fun talking about rock and roll with you. Um, so we got to conspire if we go deep blues or do we go like 80s, pick a couple 80s bands, maybe Van Halen. And we just lost Eddie. Um, I don't know. We got to start thinking about how, what, we're, what we're going to talk about when we have you on before the end of this year. Christmas time's coming. Everybody should be yeah. buying rock and roll photos. I, and Ralph, I've given away all the Tom Waits. I've given away all of um, a lot of the good Bradfords, but... Ralph's photos, this of, of Grateful Dead with Bradford Marsalis, is, would make a great gift for anybody. Um, John Lee Hooker, there's just so many great things. So we got, you can even get a picture of Ralph, maybe. Oh, how about that? <laughs> oh, oh, God. Uh, I had to do it. I had to do it. But I want to have you back on before, before Christmas um, so we can you know, get more people to buy your photographs. And we've got to pick another topic to deep dive into because you're so much fun on the show. Um, you've got to keep coming back, brother. Put up that picture again. It, I have a kind of a mean expression. Which one? This uh, one? Yeah. Maybe not, somebody yeah, could, that could mean. identify the guy in there. Or do you want me to give it away now? Who is that I'm with? Go ahead. Very famous. Go ahead, Spencer. Spencer oh. Davis. Spencer Davis. That's right. So the road, give me some love in and That's right. to Inwood. Yeah. That's right. I was taking it in uh, L.A. at the Bonaventure, one of the KLSX uh, – Rock Expos. He came up and I showed him some of my pictures I had of him and Jerry Garcia that I'd taken. Amazing. You and, have so um, many great, amazing Jerry Garcia pictures. Anyway. Now. Amazing. You know, so, Ralph, um, have, you seen, have you seen my Halloween week schedule yet? The people I have coming on Halloween week? Yeah, tell I, me about it. Ed, Ed Palermo from Ed Palermo Big Band on Monday of, of the, October 26th. Right, He has a new album coming out doing Zappa songs, Beatles songs. He's amazing. Huge Zappa fan. Tuesday, I got Ed Mann. Right, Zappa, you know, in the, from the Zappa band from 77 to 80 something, right? He's in the 81 release. Unbelievable um, xylophone player. Wednesday, I'm doing a show about the Fish Halloween shows, right? So, Ralph Fish had a tradition where they would come out and don a musical costume and do a whole album by someone in the middle of the Halloween. So, the first year in 94, I saw them do the Beatles' White Album, right? So, they did a set of their music, the whole White Album, both sides, and then a third set. The second year, they did Quadrophenia by The Who in Chicago. The third year, they did 
or Main and Light by the Talking Heads in Atlanta. I was at all these shows, so I'm going to talk about those with uh, with Dawn from uh, uh, Female Centrics. Thursday, I got Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, the drummer from Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros. Um, one of my heroes from my youth. I can't wait to talk to him. Friday, I got Dale Bozio. So Mary from Joe's Garage, right? Obviously Terry's wife for a while and lead singer Missing Persons. She's going to come on. We're going to have, celebrate Frank. She has Ooh, great uh, stories about Frank. Yeah. And then, the big surprise, I just found out an hour before we started, Halloween, Ike Willis is coming back. Ike's coming on, Halloween special, Dooner's World. Can't wait. Scott Parker's going to join us from ZappaCast.com. He runs Zappa's official podcast. So it's going to be Scott, me, and Ike. Uh, might have to rope in a few other Zappa alumni. We'll see. So big things planned for Halloween week on Dooner's World. Um, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Ralph, thanks for coming on, man. This is a lot of fun talking to you about Jimmy. You're welcome. One of, one of the loves of my life is, is this man, right? It's, it's no doubt about it. He's been with me since I was like six, seven. Um, you know, the first time I performed, I performed this Stay With the Heaven, the guitar solo in eighth grade. I'm sure it really sucked. I don't know if there's any recordings of it, but I got up there and did it because he inspired me to. So to this Jimmy day, I'm speaking. He was the mastermind. Page, Jimmy Page was the mastermind behind Led Zeppelin. Without him, they would not have ever been a Led Zeppelin. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yes, we can thank him for that with all the great music they have given us, <laughs> influencing a lot of bands in their wake and still do yeah. so today. Absolutely. They're so thank you for having today. me on. Yeah, man. So let's think about next time. Conspire about the next time Ralph's coming on doing his world. I'll, I'll think of something really cool. I'm and sure you will, brother. We'll talk about I'm it. I'm sure you will, man. Thanks for coming on, Ralph. We'll talk soon. Okay. Peace, love, and Frank Zappa.